Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. We are 24 hours away from Election Day. This is coming out the Sunday prior to Election Day, and we thought, who better to have on the show than outgoing incumbent mayor, Nahid Nenshi. Uh, Your Worship, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Chris, and thank you for keeping everyone informed during this election season. Gosh, there are a lot of candidates out there, and uh, I know that folks are really still sifting through uh, a lot of what they're looking for for their future, so I'm looking forward to having that conversation with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to that as well, but I want to start with this. 11 years in the mayor's chair. Uh, You are days away, if not hours away, from retirement from municipal politics. Are you looking forward to it? Are you looking forward to just relaxing finally? That is my plan. Uh, Going to the gym a lot, napping a lot, uh, catching up on a lot of books and a lot of TV. Uh, So absolutely looking forward to that. You know, I'll probably have to go find a new job at some point, uh, but uh, probably not right away. I don't mind telling you that I'm quite freaked out about it too. You know, we are at a really critical point in Calgary's history right now. And I often talk about how we're dealing with five simultaneous crises all at the same time, public health, mental health and addiction, economy, environment, equity, and racism. And so It feels weird to be walking away at such a critical time. But as I said back in April, sometimes you got to make space. Uh, You got to step aside and make room for new voices uh, and diverse voices and young voices to be able to fill the gaps. So here's hoping it works. Now, uh, I was going to ask you about that election eve in 2010. Uh, I will do that and then we'll jump into this current race. But You were in this position that many candidates find themselves in on Sunday before election day, wondering if you did enough, got out the vote, or going to get out the vote, contacted enough uh, residents of the city. What advice would you give to the candidates right now who are listening on the Sunday eve of election day to do, to get out, to just put them at ease before the actual stuff hits the fan on election day? Oh, you, you don't want to be at ease. Uh, the, entire, the entire campaign, people think the campaign is over on election eve. The entire campaign is about election day. All you've done for months and months and months is get ready for election day. So it's a little late for this advice now, but your entire campaign should have been about gathering people's contact information so that tomorrow on election day, you make sure they vote. The entire machine is only about that. And so ultimately there's still tons of work to do and uh, you don't get to relax until the polls close uh, tomorrow evening. So ultimately um, I remember that election eve very, very well. I was pacing uh, in one of our three election offices because our campaign had grown so much that we kept outgrowing our election offices. And I was doing last minute interviews with call and radio shows. I was recording some get out the vote videos for folks. And then I was invited at 10 p.m. the night before the election to a meeting at our third election headquarters where I had actually never been. See, when Kent Hare dropped out of the race in, on September 20th of that year, part of the deal was that we took over some of his... Um, some of his uh, financial things, including we took over his billboard contracts and things like that. But we also got his election office, which was a giant warehouse style building on the corner of 25th Avenue and McLeod Trail. And we had painted it purple and turned it into a giant election sign and used it for storage, but I'd never been in there. And so a bunch of our volunteers had, I helped paint the outside, but I'd never been inside. And a bunch of uh, volunteers had received a mysterious email saying, dress warm. It was a really warm night, but dress warm. Show up at this place at 10 o'clock at night and be ready to work. So I went and there were hundreds of volunteers there and I had no idea what we were there for. And that was actually Operation Purple Dawn. One of our volunteers had gone to every dollar store in the city and every toy store and bought out 
all of the sidewalk chalk. And all of these volunteers were given the job overnight to chalk every sidewalk they could find at a train station, uh, near where people gathering with vote Nenshi messages. So when people woke up on election day, the city was covered in purple chalk. And uh, so that was pretty cool. I wasn't allowed to participate. I was told to go home and get some rest. <laughs> and then on election day, I was actually kicked out of the office. I was actually told um, that I was being too distracting for the volunteers who were doing their work, getting out the vote. And so I went for a number of lunches. That was my day. And I tried to write my speeches for that night, my conciliatory speech, my victory speech. Um, and one of the things I noticed is I was sitting in the banker's hall food court having lunch and I looked around and I said to one of my friends that I was having lunch with, you know, we were so lucky that purple is the in color for men's fashion right now. It was true that fall, if you went to buy a tie, all the ties were purple. And I looked around and said, wouldn't it be fun if all of these people were wearing purple for me? Because everybody in the food court was wearing purple. All the men were wearing purple ties and many of the women were wearing purple scarves and things. And I would just jokingly said, gosh, I'm just going to pretend this is all for me. And then one guy shyly walked up to me, you know, banker type, very put together suit and tie. And he kind of shyly walked up to me and he said, hey, listen, can I take a photo with you today? And I said, sure. So we took a picture and as we were taking the picture, he said, I wore purple today for you. And he said it loud enough that people at nearby tables heard it. And for the first time of many, many, many times uh, since then in the last 11 years, we got a huge lineup of people who wanted to take a picture. And every one of them said, hey, I wore purple today for you. So that, that was a good day. Uh, and then there's a bunch of fun election night stories uh, that I've told many times about how election night went uh, after the polls closed. But ultimately, I hope that uh, the candidates are nervous, but that they are excited about what's coming forward. Before we turn to the future, let's talk about the past 11 years in the mayoral chair, 11 years at the helm of this great city of ours. Looking back, do you have any regrets of things that you could have pushed a little bit harder on or do you look back on it with pride and you are leaving the city in a better shape than when you got it? You know, the question that I really had to ask myself um, over and over again, and particularly that I had to ask myself when I was making the decision on whether to stick around or not, was have I fulfilled that very simple promise that I made to myself in the city 11 years ago, which is, are we leaving it better than we found it? And in some cases, it's hard to say that. We're in the middle of a pandemic, we're in the middle of an economic crisis. But when you take the long view over the course of the 11 years, I really do think that things are immeasurably better now. And I remember saying that at the beginning, you know, I just want people to say, when I take transit, it's better now. When I go to the library or access city services, it's better than it was. And I really do think that we have achieved that. And that is something that I am very, very proud of. Because I think together as a community, we have moved forward. You know, when I started, remember the city had just hit a million people. And we had just gone from being what I call a large, small city to a small, large city. We've increased the population by not quite 50% in that time period. And we have moved so far from where we were 11 years ago. And I think by and large in a positive direction. Of course, there are regrets. Um, you know, one of the big ones is I think we badly mishandled the file on the Olympics, uh, which we should have had. There was this minister, I don't know if you know him, but I suspect he regrets how he handled that file too. He, he's currently upstairs making a lot of noise knowing that I'm interviewing you right now. And I told him at 1030, I have an interview. So hopefully he gets this message and stops making the noise and feeding the dogs. But yes, I know that minister quite well. Um, and, you know, we just mishandled that. We were, we were amateurs in a big file and we allowed other political um, interference. The fact that uh, Premier Notley and Prime Minister Trudeau actually hated each other at that point uh, get in the way of what would have been a great thing for Calgary. And now we're in a position where we're going to have to spend the money on upgrading the facilities anyway. 
we just don't get the Olympics at the end of it, which is altogether too bad. And so there are certainly things that uh, could have been better that we could have managed a lot better. But ultimately, I, I leave feeling very good about the world uh, as it now stands. And I, and I got to say, you know, politicians don't believe in polls, and I certainly don't. But I did smile today that the very last poll that came out on my approval rating showed that after 11 years, my approval rating is still 65%. And uh, that's that makes me feel good that people really think that good things have happened in the city for this time. We are, as you said in the beginning statement, we are at a crossroads in the city. Uh, yourself and uh, the, I would say the majority of your council colleagues are leaving or seeking higher office. One federally, Wait. some running from your position. This is going to leave a vacuum in the city hall. Do you think the next council is going to be ready for the challenges that you laid out in your five crises that we have facing the city right now? Look, Chris, I'm very nervous about it. But ultimately, I also remember that we live in a democracy and we live in a place where government works. Right. And that's something that we can be extremely proud of. When there's a crisis, we can rely on our government. When there's not a crisis, we can rely on our government. And too many people in the world just don't have that. They just don't have that ability to rely. And so ultimately, we will be fine. We'll be strong. The community is full of people who love the community. The community is full of people who want this community be, to be better. And so it is true, though, that we have a historically large um, turnover in our city council. There will be, if I'm doing my math correctly, there will be a minimum of nine new members of council out of 15. There could be as many as 13 or 14 out of 15. I think it's quite likely that there's one member of council who's just not going to lose. So there'll be one who is almost certain to come back. I mean, I'll just break it down for you. There are five members of council running for re-election. Quite bluntly, two of them don't deserve to win. They're terrible councillors and they should not be re-elected. Two of them are in a real fight with real strong competitors, and one of them will probably win no problem. And then you have the race for mayor, where it's quite likely that one member of council will win. One existing member of council will probably be the next mayor. So ultimately, that means that there could be as few as two returning members of council. Now, there are two former members of council running for re-election. I think one will win, one will not. That's just my prognostication. Um, but you're not going to have very many people who know where the bathroom is. But that said, we do have some really thoughtful folks running with some good ideas for the city. The new mayor is going to have quite the job of bringing folks together up front. But I think she or he uh, will be up to it. And the real hard thing, the first task they're going to face is they got to pass a budget. And so they have to pass a budget. Uh, about five weeks after the election. And that's not easy. It's a four and a half billion dollar budget. You got to know what you're doing. You got to know your way around the balance sheet, a balance sheet and income statement and budgeting. So ultimately, you know, we've done hard work. The public servants have done incredible work um, on putting together a budget. But, you know, there are candidates whose promises in their election cannot actually be achieved within the budget envelope we have. It's actually impossible. And so there's, there may be a huge problem uh, in trying to fulfill uh, your, your election promises and passing a budget right away without massive service cuts and massive disruption. And so, yeah, I'm a little nervous about that. But uh, I, I, again, servants are great and they know what they're doing. And frankly, I've worked with them to write a good budget. So hopefully, uh, at least there'll be a good base for people to work from. I would also like to put in my two cents on this, and that is some candidates who are running, and I've had the pleasure to interview a few of them, might want to look at what the municipal government actually does, because I think, they're, I think they think they're running provincially or even federally. So uh, please, please, please look at the candidates who are you're voting for on election day. That's all I'm going to put in my two cents. Here, let me make this a bit easier for people. The municipal government does all the important stuff. I always suggest that 
if the federal government disappeared while we were having this conversation, it would be probably a few weeks before any of us noticed. If the provincial government disappeared, you'd notice pretty quick because we're in a pandemic and there'd be no schools or hospitals. But if you municipal there, there is, there's schools and hospitals right now, and I, my there surgery is actually back on, and I can go get my cancer removed. Like, really? Well, there is a provincial government in place, um, but uh, maybe we'd be, have been better off if they had gone on a longer vacation. No, wait, that was the problem. Um, but in any case, um, but if your municipal government disappeared while we were having this conversation, well, there'd be no roads. There'd be no parks, there'd be no emergency response, there'd be no clean water, there'd be no 911, um, there'd be no recreation facilities, uh, there'd be no economic development. So you'd notice pretty quick because you'd be dead. And so those are the things that we focus on, the things that keep people alive and safe and happy every day. But it's a lot of money. And so if you have a candidate who, for example, is promising a four year task for tax freeze, while well, investing heavily in the largest department, which is the police, how do you do both of those things? Um, if you have a candidate that's promising that as assessment bases go up, taxes will go down, that's actually makes no mathematical sense. And it makes me question how you sit on a budget committee for a finance committee for four years and not know how the budget works. Um, but you know, the fact remains that the city of Calgary has the lowest taxes in the country. And that's something I'm very proud of. And I'm proud of the fact that we have taken a billion dollars out of the city budget without attacking frontline services to make it more efficient. But there's not a lot more there. And so, you know, citizens have to say, look, in a time of record high inflation, we're all feeling it at the grocery store and at the gas pump, while well, your city feels it too. And so to freeze your taxes uh, while protecting the police or the fire department or transit or whoever you want to protect means that smaller departments like parks, recreation, get massive cuts. And I don't think that uh, citizens really are ready for that. And I don't think the candidates have been particularly upfront on explaining that that has to happen. You know, if you want a four-year tax freeze, there's only two ways of doing it. One is massive cuts uh, across the board. And if you're protecting large departments like the police, that means bigger cuts for everyone else. The second is taking money out of the savings account and using it to paper, paper over operating deficits, which is terrible, uh, dishonest budgeting. And it also means you're draining the savings accounts. And a few years from now, you're building massive, uh, you're building massive uh, a hole in your budget that has to be filled by much yeah. larger tax increases by the next person. Both are very dishonest. I, it is a secret ballot on election day. Uh, have you made up your mind? Because I know there is a lot of people in the city who are still struggling. They're looking at all the candidates. They're trying to figure out, you don't need to say who you are going to vote for, but have you made up your mind on your ballot on all the issues that are facing daylight savings time, the Senate candidates, uh, fluoride, have you made up your mind? Are you still in the same boat as I would say the majority of people right now looking at the candidates for your ward, for your trustees, for your uh, mayor? I have made it. I have not made up my mind, but I do have endorsements. Ready? Yep. I will share them. Okay. If you're lucky enough to live in wards 11 and 13, you have an excellent candidate running for school board trustee, Nancy Close. She has worked next to me for 11 years. She is super awesome. And uh, she will do what is needed on that school board. Also, she served on the school board before, so she knows what she's doing. Um, and in this ridiculous, unconstitutional political theater of a Senate election, um, you know, there are two fun protest votes. One is a great community guy called Chad Saunders, who's running as Jet Thunders. Um, but he's actually bringing some real things to the table. There's another guy who's a political gadfly called Duncan Kinney. Um, but there's actually a really bright light in the Senate race, a really amazing person called Karina Pillay. I knew Karina when she was the mayor of Slave Lake during the terrible fires there. Since then, she went back to school. She became a physician. She's been advocating for public health. She is awesome. She's exactly the kind of person you want in public life. So there you go. Those are my two endorsements. Um, Three but, endorsements, uh, including Chad. 
Chad and, 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 and you keep throwing Chad and Duncan, I guess. But um, uh, and I'm going to vote no on daylight savings time because although it shocks people to know this, I am in many ways conservative, small C, which means that if you want to make major change, you got to explain to me why. And no one has really explained to me why we should change that um, beyond it's not good for small children and pets. And it's a pain to change your clocks. Well, all of my clocks are automatic now. <laughs> and small children are only small children for a tiny portion of their lives. And because a lot of my professional career deals with national and international stuff, it's just weird to me that we would sometimes be the same time as Thunder Bay. And I just think it makes doing national and international business harder. And it should probably have been standard time, not daylight time. So I'm probably going to vote no on that. And clearly, one should vote no on this equalization referendum. We were promised a referendum on a fair deal for Alberta. What the referendum question actually is, is to end equalization, which means for all of the Albertans who've been lucky enough to be educated in different provinces or who've come here from different parts of Canada, well, screw where you came from. Those universities don't deserve to be good. Um, those people don't deserve a decent quality of life. Absolutely not. Yes, Alberta needs a better deal. Yes. Harper and Kenny badly negotiated the last equalization formula. That's true. But to actually end equalization ends Canada. And it takes pretty rich for a premier to say end equalization, while at the same time begging for medical assistance from other provinces during this pandemic. So I'm pretty strong-willed on that one too. Um, I think council made a mistake taking out fluoride without talking to the people. Vote your conscience on fluoride. I will vote for putting fluoride back in the water because I'm convinced by the data that kids, especially low-income kids, are seeing significant dental problems since we've taken it out. Um, and so there you go. That's where I'm at. And as for my counselor and my mayor, I don't know yet. <laughs> I've been on the street a lot, watching a lot of debates going, no. <laughs> we are uh, just a few minutes away until we have to wrap up here, but I have one last question before I start my wrap up here, Your Worship. And that is, we are a more divided city after this election. I am looking at the hate that is being spewed on election signs. I'm seeing the vandalism of election signs. I'm seeing social media hate. We are going into a divided time in our city. What hope do you have? And I know you are scared and I think everyone is right now as well. What hope do you have that the next council is going to be able to bring us together in a way that we can recover from this pandemic, from this oil collapse, from this environmental crisis. What hope do you give to the people who are going out and voting tomorrow morning on the future of the city? I mean, look, we get to live in the best place in the world. And as much as this campaign has not been particularly edifying, you know, one <laughs> things that one of the things that I'm really seeing among my family and friends is unlike in previous years nobody seems to be going to the ballot box with much joy which actually makes me sad because I like to think that in 2010 in 2013 and even in 2017 even in that ugly campaign in 2017 people went to the ballot box to vote for someone and they were excited to do so. And I always say, take your kids when you go vote to get them into that habit. And I'm hearing from people, I don't want my kids to see how upset I am going to the <laughs> um, And you know, it's a challenge, even in the mayoral race, right? You have, if the polls are to be believed, one of the front runners is basically running because he hates the city of Calgary and doesn't want, um, you know, as in the government right? And uh, doesn't love government. And I always wonder, why do people run for government who don't love government? <laughs> um, you know, you can always make it more efficient, you can always make it way better. But if you fundamentally don't believe in government, it's sort of strange. And then you have someone running who most people probably couldn't name any of her policies, but no, she's not that guy. <laughs> and so they're willing to vote for her because she's not that guy. And so you're missing a lot. Of, and then you've got a bunch of other candidates who've tried to separate themselves from the fray, but I don't know how successful they've been. And what you don't have is anyone really putting forward beyond mumble words, a really positive view of the future and of what is possible here. But you know what? It doesn't really matter because Calgarians have that positive view of the future because the people who live here 
understand that we really are, no word of hyperbole, living in one of the best places in the world. You know, I never stop talking because it's a brag point about the fact that The Economist called us the best city to live in in the entire Western Hemisphere. And that's a pretty big deal for a often frozen city in the middle of the Canadian prairies for the world to say, listen, this is where people, people want to be. So yeah, I'm deeply worried that young people are saying, I don't see a future for me in Calgary. I'm deeply worried that we have been resting on our laurels and, and I'll criticize the last three provincial governments for this, not understanding what was really happening in terms of the forces that bring people here and take them away and just assumed we would always have a young society. That's why we're talking about changing the pension plan, but it's not true anymore of young uh, working age people just moving here immediately and making their lives here. So this is a really big challenge. We need young people to want to stay. We need to be able to attract more young people. But as I remind myself on that sweaty October 18th, so exactly 11 years ago, on that sweaty October 18th uh, in that basement office, the very first words of my speech were, today Calgary is different than it was yesterday. It's better than it was yesterday. And it's not because of me, it's because of you. And critically, that is what we all have to remember. This city is full of people who love this city. It's full of 1.4 million people who love this place and want it to be better. It's full of people doing acts of service, of seva, of heroism every single day for one another. And yeah, there's some idiots who think it's smart to protest in front of a hospital but they are so small and they are so weak and they are so meaningless in terms of this grand experiment of what we are trying to do together and what we are trying to build together. This is what matters. And one of the best things we can do is we can be grateful for all of those hundred plus people who put their names in to serve in public life we should be grateful for every one of them. But the best thing we can do for the new mayor is we can help her or him by saying, it's not just your job. You're not the one who's gonna heal our divisions. You're not the one who's gonna bring us forward. It's our job. And it's our job to support you and to lift you and to tell you when you're doing things wrong, but ultimately to be able to help you help us move towards that bright future. So, you know, I was just reading an interview with myself where I said something pretty eloquent that I don't remember saying. So I'll say it again, because it's pretty eloquent. And I basically said, look, things seem harder now. And the jerks are louder now. But that just means that we have to work harder now. And so on a beautiful autumn day, Look up at that big blue sky, that big blue sky under which people have been building dreams for thousands of years, and understand that that blue sky is so big because it has to be that big to hold those dreams. And our job is to continue to work on every one of those dreams, to continue to build a place that, as I've been saying for so many years, Nobody cares, or it doesn't matter, or it's not relevant who your daddy was or what your last name is. That regardless of where you come from or how you worship or whom you love, you belong here. And you can be successful here. And your kids and their kids and their kids can have incredible futures here. But that doesn't happen because politicians talk about it. It happens because every single one of us builds that promise to the community every day. It happens because every one of us uses our everyday hands, our everyday hearts, our everyday minds, and these days increasingly our everyday voices to make that kind of extraordinary change. And so we have to recommit ourselves to that. And that new council and that new mayor will just be an expression of who we wanna be as human beings and who we wanna be as a community. And so the real work, 
all right, let's 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 put it this way. You can take the 19th off. <laughs> Everyone needs a rest. But on the 20th, and more specifically on the 25th, when I'm actually done this job and the new mayor and counselor sworn in, that's where the real work begins. And that's not just work for them, it's work for all of us. Your Worship, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. I wish you the best of, uh, I would say retirement, but I know that that is not a thing that is in your vocabulary. So I wish you- oh, I'm sorry I, to do it. I have an enormous, <laughs> this, what people don't understand about is that I have an enormous capacity for being lazy. And uh, I don't always get to express it. So that's my plan. A lot of naps, a lot of gym, a lot of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I wish you the best of that. And uh, I, 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 want, I, I want you to leave me on this and the, the listeners and the viewers on this. Why should people vote? Oh, you have to vote. You know, um, one of the things that I'm really, I was excited about. Well, see, it's never a short answer, right, Chris? So you're getting a long answer. Back in 2010, and up until 2010, politics in Calgary and in Alberta were very sclerotic. They were very rigid. And nobody cared that much because conventional wisdom was nothing would ever change. And so, and it didn't really matter who you voted for because things would always be the same. And nobody voted. So the voter turnout in our elections was maybe a third. And in that first election in 2010, we had historically high voter turnout and it has remained that high. And that is because people were willing to actually understand that who we elect matters, that our involvement in government matters, that it makes a difference, not just in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us in the community that we're trying to build here. And that's what is the most important thing for me is that even though some of them are jerks, the fact that people are so much more engaged in their community now matters. The fact that 11 years ago, people took a risk, not just on me, but on a different future matters. And so tomorrow, if you haven't already voted in the advance poll, and we have had record turnout at the advance polls, but tomorrow, that's why you go vote. So tonight, make a voting plan, figure out when you're going to vote, take your kids, show them what voting means, and get out there and make it an occasion of great joy because it is our chance to build a better future for everybody. So we'll see you at the polls. Um, as the mayor just said, vote, 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 vote. Um, I have beat this dead horse in, from August 1st till today, but I'm going to say it one more time. If you do not vote, I do not want to see you complaining on social media that you, you're, the council does not represent you because if you do not vote, you do not get a voice. So go out and vote. And like the mayor said, bring your kids, teach them about democracy, because at the end of the day, democracy only survives with voters and candidates. Your worship, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for doing what you've been doing. Let's build our future.